So, what's the purpose of a bluff? In poker, it's to deceive the opponent by betting or raising with a weak hand, making them fold stronger hands. In negotiation, it's to create a false sense of strength or resolve to influence the other party's decision. In sports, to fake an action or move to gain an advantage or deceive the opponent. In military strategy, to create a false impression of true strength and intention to deceive the enemy. In everyday life, to assert oneself or create a false impression to achieve a goal or protect oneself. So bluffing is pretty much something that happens all the time. And the way that people bluff you, they bluff you, one, to test your strength, and two, to deceive you that they are more attractive or that they have more resources than you think they do. So as a result, you succumb to them because they're bluffing. And people bluff you generally to test your strength. They bluff you to hide their weaknesses and to make you think that they are more confident, that they have more options, and that they're more willing to walk away than you are. That's the whole point of that, to create an illusion. And we all do it to a certain extent. Some people are more toxic than others. But we're going to talk about how they do that and how you can counteract that and how you can actually reverse it through one strategy that's really powerful. Actually, two strategies I'm going to teach you. And we're going to be watching an example of a of in, in, in the animal kingdom of how animals um, how animals call out bluffs and how you could do it and how animals actually react in a very similar way to humans react. And then towards the end, we're going to be using the book, The 33 Strategies of War, to talk about one strategy, which is called um, um, defeating them bite by bite, which is how most people usually manipulate you, how most people usually take away at your self-esteem, um, and, and how they use you for self-esteem at your cost. It's going to be really popular. And the reason why they're testing your strength is because most likely you have sent signs of weakness. They faint at you to see if you will retreat or, and run. Then they get aggressive and start chasing. It's like an animal, right? It's like a gorilla, right? How they say gorilla charge you to bluff you. Gorilla charge you to intimidate you. But they say that if a gorilla charges you and you don't bluff, I mean, and you don't faint and you don't react to his bluffs, what happens is that you start to see the reality that he's trying to hide. Let me give you guys an example. This is what pretty much people do to you when they assume or where they when they think you're the one that's putting on a facade when they send signs of weakness this is what people do pretty much charged and charged and charged again and i think what they say is that when somebody charges at at you with a bluff what you have to do is do the complete opposite of what your instincts tell you and that's do nothing do nothing and the reason why doing nothing is the strategy it's because when somebody's bluffing you, your lack of reaction reflects to them the truth that they're also bluffing and reflects to them that most likely you're not reacting because maybe there is something behind you. In other words, maybe you believe that you might have, you might have something that backs up your confidence. There's a reason why you're not reacting. There's a reason that you're not over-pursuing. Because most likely you have that type of confidence. So once they sense that you're not reacting to their, to their bluffs, what happens is that people all of a sudden get passive, right? They either get more aggressive because they don't think that maybe, maybe you're faking confidence or they start acting more passive because they realize it didn't work this time, but now they don't want to lose you, right? Now, why do they do this? Well, first of all, deception, they use deception as a strategy, right? At, a, at its core, bluffing is a form of deception aimed at manipulating the perception of others to the bluffer's benefit. It leverages theory of mind, the ability to understand that other people have beliefs, desires, and intentions that are different from one's own. By misrepresenting one's position or intentions, a person can influence the decision and behavior of others in a way that is advantageous to them. 
Another reason why people bluff is psychological warfare. Bluffing can be used to destabilize opponents or comp competitors by creating uncertainty and confusion. In a strategic game, sport, business, negotiation, causing others to question their perceptions and strategies can provide a significant psychological edge. So even if they're willing to walk away, you let them walk away, right? Sometimes when people bluff, they become difficult. They yell. They are pushy and demanding, right? They get aggressive. It's like it's like if that it's like that Russian girl that I told you about who like who will like the first few times she would text me screaming like she was like, Hey, what the fuck are you? And I'm like, what the fuck is wrong with this girl? And I'm like, what is wrong with her? And she did it like a few times and after like the third or fourth time, I was like, yo, calm the fuck down. Don't talk to me that way. And she was like, Oh, my fault, my fault, my fault. I'm just saying, you know. So that she was super aggressive. As soon as I was like, you know what, man, this girl's out of her goddamn mind. I'm not dealing with this shit. I called her out on it. And what happened then is that she just got more passive. She was like, oh, my fault, my fault. And I'm like, look, man, you talk to me one more time, I'm, you, you're leaving. I, thought, I remember telling her that. <laughs> I was like, you, you talk to me like that one more time, you're getting the fuck out, right? Um, I was like, don't look miserable. I, I, what was it I told her? I was like, if you act miserable one time, you're, you're going back home. <laughs> right? <laughs> and what she does she does that because it works right she does that because some guys in the past let her get away with the bullshit you know they'll test you by being late and seeing whether or not you could tolerate the lateness they'll test you by calling you names or being disrespectful to see whether or not you're actually gonna fight back those little things it's like when dogs eat an animal it's look, bite by bite. They don't give one big bite and take a big chunks. No. Little nibbles. One bite here, one bite there. And the problems with those little bites is that usually the disrespect that they initially do that usually escalates over time are things that are that you would you will rationalize and say it's no big deal. They do it and then they do it again, but it's still not big enough to to complain about it. But, but enough for you to notice, but not big enough for you to call it out. So what they do is that they start to play in your, con uh, they start to play on your conservative instincts to just say, you know what? <sighs> yeah, this, but it's, it's no big deal, I guess. I mean, they're nice, you know. This, that's just dumb. So, it, but then once you realize what's going on, once you realize you've that you've you've you sort of like tolerated it, it's already too late. It's better to cut it off on the start. Any signs of bickering, any sign of them being difficult, any sign of them sending mixed signals, any sign of them being way too cocky around you, any sign, any glimpse of that, you, re you don't react and you just, you either call it out or you pull away. For example, um, there is this one girl who, uh, who I'm texting right now, right? And the first time we met on the date, she was late, 40 minutes late, 40 minutes late, people. And I remember before we, we went out, I was like, hey, um, before we go, let's, because what happened, she canceled twice, right? Before that, she canceled twice. And it's kind of like she's canceling. It's no big deal, right? Now she's late, and you're like, well. But then you th you start thinking, wait a minute. It's been this, this, and this. This is like adding up, but it's like small enough to ignore. But when you add it up, it kind of irks you. So she came out. She we um she we met. She was like, hey, and I was like, wait. I was like, look. I like you, and I want y'all. I'm kidding. I was like, look, I like you. But what are we what are we doing here? Let's find out. I don't think this might work out. She was like, why? And I was like, look, you canceled twice and now you're 40 minutes late. I'm not, I'm just gonna be honest with you, I don't like this. So if you think this is gonna continue, it's better off right now we just cut it off and cut our losses. She was like, no, 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 I swear, I swear, I swear, this is the last time it's gonna happen. And I was like, look, man, you told me that you're a bad tech, so you told me that. And I am telling you that I prefer not to date someone who is naturally a bad texter. 
So if you think you're going to be Miss Bad Texture with me, let's just get it out the way and just end it right now. Politely, obviously. I, I don't want to be an asshole. She's like, no, 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 no. I promise not to do that. Well, the date happened. And she did that shit twice after the date where she canceled. And then she takes three days to respond. You know what happened after that? Blocked. <laughs> but what I'm trying to tell you is that disrespect, disrespect usually happens in small ways. And really sneaky people know this. And they know that if they just take little bites, you're not going to notice it. But it's still, it's, it still inflicts pain. But not the type of pain for you to really complain about if you barely know them, but enough for it to register and to affect you psychologically. Cut it at the bud from the start. From the start. Simply because people start testing you to see how much disrespect you could tolerate, how much bullshit you could tolerate, and this is how they do it. And these are all bluffs. These are all bluffs. They're testing your strength. They're testing your perceived value. They're testing your perceived self-love that you have over yourself. They're testing it. They're trying to make you break your own rules. What you have to do is not react or mirror them. You could either not react or literally do the same shit they're doing to you and mirror them. Because then what that does is that mirroring people infuriates them. But they have to care. Because sometimes... If, you're, if they're bluffing and you mirror them, it works, honestly. <laughs> if they're bluffing you, if they're bluffing to test your strength and you mirror what they're doing to you, what you'll notice is that they're going to start reacting and they're going to stop the games because they know, they, fi- they know that you figured them out. But if you mirror them and they, don't, and, they don't, and they don't react to it and they keep doing exactly what they're doing, what that means is that they don't give a fuck about you, but they're just bored and entertaining you. Don't pursue it. These types of people are chokeable motherfuckers. <laughs> people that that you just like hate to know. Like these types of people are the type of people that that they just ruin your interactions. So what you have to do is make sure that you have a base of happiness from within yourself. Be so content within yourself. That you don't need someone to make you feel fulfilled. And you develop that through developing a meditation practice. You can either purchase my course, Emotional Mastery, or um, go to a 10-day silent retreat. But that fixing that will allow you to deal with uncertainty and confusion without grasping out onto other people for validation and for stability. All you have to do is look inward through a meditation practice And you'll find the stability that you used to look for in other people who try to freaking manipulate you. And this is how you do it, man. People bluff. And and look, if you don't want people to bluff you, then just make sure that you become more at ease with yourself. That you don't tolerate bullshit. That you develop self-love through a meditation practice. Develop self-validation through a meditation practice. Develop validation through your friends and not through romantic partners. And don't tolerate bullshit from the start. From the start, call them out. If they start, if they're acting super interested and they want to go out with you, but they take one or two days, they're scheduling the dates, right? But they take one or two days in between response, call them out on it. Respectfully say, hey, hey, Tyrone. Hey, hey, Melissa, look, I, I want to go out with you, but um, are, you, are you naturally a bad texter? Because if you are, uh, this might not work out. You get what I'm saying? Like you, you have to do this because people hide behind the the fact that they know that if you call them out, some people they know if you call them out, they can act like the victim and say, "Hey, you're being too pushy. You're being too needy. You don't even know me to be calling me out on that." If they play that card, fuck them. No, not fuck them. But if they play that card, they, they're nasty. They're dirty players. They're dirty, dirty players. They're the type of person that if you call them out on something that they did wrong. That they'll play the victim. You don't want to deal with people like that. There's just nasty people, man. It's crazy, man. I'm going to go to a quick commercial break. And then we're going to read a part of the book of the 33 Strategies of War by Robert Greene. Where he talks about this strategy. And how people use um, um, this type of manipulation where they bluff at you. 
as a way to gain power over you psychologically and emotionally. All right, ladies and gentlemen, if you guys ever want to learn how to use your feminine energy to influence people, learn how to use your masculine energy to become more assertive, and also learn how to blend both energies to improve your dating life, your spiritual life, honestly, <laughs> um, your relationship life, your family life, your career life, this is the course for you. If I had to make a course for my nieces, I have two nieces, one is 8, 19, and one is 14, 15, 16, holy shit. Oh my God, he's a bad fucking uncle. He's a, he's a bad uncle. Get him. Shut up, Melissa. You should, you should get this course, right? And this is the course that I will make for them. So for example, watch the curriculum, right? In the first week, we're going to be showing you how to establish a strong masculine foundation without letting it hurt your feminine energy. This masculine foundation is a source of who you are, right? It's, it's your bodyguard. Without this, your, whatever feminine energy you create, will be destroyed by the outside because your your fem, your masculine is your shield. So we'll talk about goal setting. We'll talk about how to develop a serious attitude. We're gonna be talking about how to um, how to use more logic, how to use more goal oriented behavior. It's more how to be a man, <laughs> you know. It, you know. Now the next one is how to embrace the feminine energy, right? This one would this one will teach you about how to minimize excessive masculine traits, developing self awareness healing abundant feminine energy, regulating your emotion, vo uh, mastering voice qualities and, ex and facial expressions, surrendering control and allowing pain to be felt. This is honestly, it's, it's, it, it, this will supercharge, like, like, like Kayo Ken, your masculine energy. After that, we have um, femininity in the workplace and how to be feminine in the workplace without letting people take advantage of you and the nuances of um, how women on power should behave versus women who are subordinates in the workplace and even the dress code. They, they, these are, this is based on psychology, people. It's kind of insane. I'm actually excited about this one. The next week, we talk about navigating the labyrinth of male and female friendship. And this, a lot of women find confusing, so we talk about that. And how to identify envious friends, how to identify the good friends, how to keep male friends, and how to keep female friends. Week five, we talk about how to release the burden of the past and stop and destroy mental projections. This is actually really powerful. Um, and this, and then week six, we talk about how to increase your observational power so that you so that you can read people better. Um, and we have a bunch of bonuses. It, the course starts at um, nine at ninety nine dollars, um, and you guys can pre order the course today at sixty nine dollars before it goes out. Um, if you're watching this, most likely I'm in the meditation retreat, so I really, most likely I will be praying for all of you guys. And um, just click on the description down below of the video right there. You'll see it, and you can pre order that course. It's gonna be out by by the end of next month or the beginning of February of, of March. One of the two people, because I have a 10-day retreat to do. And I want to I want to finish the course um, after the retreat, because I think the, the ideas are going to be so much better. All right, man, I'll see you guys later. Free order, man. Oh, I'm closing the channel. There's a chapter in the 33 Strategies Award that talks about that, and we're going to be listening to it so that we can expand upon what we're talking about. And their chapter is about <clears throat> defeating them. What's, what is it about? It's a, I think it's called... Uh, la, la, la take small bites and the reason why is because small bites allows you to to harm people without them retaliating it's a it's a strategy that leaves a lot of people defenseless especially the people who are afraid of confrontation watch this the empire you want to forge and then to identify so he the sense about of your objective aggression the key to making it work is to have a clear sense of your objective, the empire you want to forge. So in this, uh, in this part, he's talking about the use this strategy to take over an empire, right? But in this case, is people using the strategy to take you over psychologically, to test your strength and completely dominate you over time and, and create an exploitive re relationship. And then to identify the small outlying areas of the empire that you will first gobble up. So that means each bite what, must have a lot. What is the first thing that you can do to test them that they won't fight back in? What is the first subtle form of disrespect that if you could do that they will notice but not fight back? Listen. In an overall strategy, but must be small enough that no one must have a lot of the empire that you will first gobble up. Each, Each bite, bite must have, have a logic, logic in an overall strategy, strategy, but must be small enough that no one senses your larger intentions. Enough if, for them to rationalize it away. If your bites are too big, 
you will take on more than you are ready for and find yourself overwhelmed by problems. Right. So if you disrespect, if they disrespect you too obviously, your defenses go up. But if it's a subtle disrespect, your defenses don't go up. And so that will then you could get if they keep doing it, then it's enough for them to get used to it. It's almost like heating up a frog slowly that they don't notice what's really going on. If you bite too fast, other people will see what you are up to. Let the passage of time masterfully disguise your intentions. So they re disrespect you a little bit today and time passes. Then you get acclimated. And then they, they disrespect you in this direction, in that direction. And over time, people will just begin to dominate you psychologically. And it's usually bite by bite. Give you the appearance of someone of modest ambition. By the time your rivals wake up to what you have consumed, they risk being consumed themselves uh -huh. if they stand in your way. Keys to warfare. The strategy works as follows. Suppose there is something you want or need for your security and power. Take it without discussion or warning, and you give your enemies a choice, either to fight or to accept the loss and leave you alone. This is so, this is honestly so psychologically profound. Because what he's saying is that, you test a country's strength and a country's resolve by literally taking something from them. Not too big, but small enough, but not too big for them to risk war. And then they have a choice. Either fight or become conservative and say, well, it's no big deal. And usually what happens is that they, they say it's no big deal. And so the time will pass then. Time will pass. And then you take another bite. Enough for them to notice it. But not enough for them to want to go a full out war for. This is it's just honestly, it, it, it's how people bluff. They want you to notice the pain. They want you to sense the aggression. But because of your conservative mindset, they don't, they, they don't go far enough for you to actually take action. Is whatever you have taken and your unilateral action in taking it worth the bother, cost, and danger of waging war? Which costs more? The war, which might easily escalate into something large, or the loss? Take something of real value, and they will have to choose carefully. They have a big decision to make. Mm -hmm. Take something small and marginal, though, and it is almost impossible for your opponents to choose battle. Yep. There are likely to be many more reasons for leaving you alone. Like, for, for example, you could say, you know, why you don't have to get mad at her taking two days to respond. It's no big deal. But if you let it continue, this thought of it's no big deal will create a chain. It will create an exploitive dynamic. And it's, it's one small step each time. Not enough for you to notice how far you've gotten, but enough for you to make progress. It's really sneaky shit, man. Fighting over something small. You have played to your enemy's conservative instincts, which are generally stronger than their acquisitive ones. And soon, your ownership of this property becomes a fait accompli, part of the status quo, which is always best left alone. That is so profound. That is so true. It's almost like when somebody's in a relationship and, and, and they say, why don't you say something, man? They're being disrespectful. You, they say, well, it's, it's not worth getting into a fight. Then we can have an argument and then I, I'd rather not. And without them even noticing, they don't notice how much power they're giving away. They don't notice how exploitive this relationship is. They don't notice how far they have gotten from, the who, from who they really are because it's no big deal. They have succumbed to their conservative, like, instincts. Sooner or later, as part of this strategy, you will take another small bite. This time, your rivals are warier. They are starting to see a pattern. But what you have taken is once again small. And once again, they must ask themselves if is it fighting worth you is worth the headache. They didn't do it before. Why now? So, th so then, so now staying quiet becomes a pattern. Staying quiet becomes reinforced. Staying quiet is something that you that you that they are imprinting in your mind. 
all because you want to avoid conflict. Execute a fait accompli strategy subtly and well, as de Gaulle did. And even though a time may come when your goal becomes clear, and when they regret their previous pacifism and consider war, by that time, it's too late. you will have altered the playing field. You by that your... time, once you finally choose to leave, once you finally choose to battle, your self-esteem is already lower. They have so much leverage over you. You have such an unwillingness to walk away, and, and you can sense this person's willingness to walk away that you have no leverage. It's like removing a limb in order to escape. So small, nor so easy to defeat. To take you on now entails a different kind of risk. There is a different, more powerful reason for avoiding conflict. Only nibble at what you want, and you never spark enough anger, fear, or mistrust to make people overcome their natural reluctance to fight. So the way to overcome this is to have no tolerance for bullshit. The, the, this whole thing, all oh, what the lectures, I posted a status yesterday on Instagram about that, how some people ignore your messages, but love your stories. And some people said, the lectures, you, you, that's petty. I'm like, no, that's how they get you. They do something enough for you to notice and, and be annoyed, but not enough to justify a full blown confrontation. Fuck that. If they like you, you confronting them will call out their bluff. And if they get offended at the fact that they're taking two, that you're calling them out because they take two or three days to respond, if they're offended by that, they are a dirty player. They are dirty. They play the victim even though they know they're wrong. Even though they know they're, they're trying to manipulate you, avoid that person. Fuck them. Let enough time pass between bites. And you will also play to the shortness of people's attention spans. Reversal. Should you see or suspect that you yourself are being attacked bite by bite, a quick and forceful response will usually be enough to discourage the nibblers, who, who often resort to this strategy out of, weakness. out of weakness and cannot afford many battles. So this is why I'm telling you, it feels like you're overreacting, but you're not. There's a reason why you're, you feel discombobulated when they start acting confusing and, 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 and in a way that doesn't make sense because you are registering manipulation but rationally the mind doesn't they, they don't want rationally you don't want to look you don't want to look too needy too too aggressive and so you tamp it down and they rely on that they rely on that part of your psychology if they are tougher and more ambitious that forceful response becomes more crucial still letting them get away with their bites however small is too dangerous nip them in the bud exactly and that's why it's an example of of posturing you see that in in war and i'm not i'm not gonna talk about the israeli and iran is it i don't know which one it is anyway so one if you notice like this weekend both countries just did attacks just to save face right and the reason why is because if you let one person get away with something Time will pass and they're going to do it again. And, the, and, 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 and because people repeat themselves, whenever they attack again, you most likely will have the same response. And you're not going to be able to think long term. You're not going to be able to think that if you let this happen long term, it's going to happen more. You, but, but you don't think that way because you're reacting to the moment. And when you start reacting to the moment, when somebody's playing, you're manipulating, you're making you stress, making you impatient, it's more, it's more difficult to think long term because you're in, in crisis mode. You got to focus on what's going on now. And they rely on you not being able to think long term, not being able to think five, six steps ahead. They rely on you not being able to, to anticipate and notice what's happening. Because once you notice what's happening, you're already attached. Cut that shit at the source. Don't let them manipulate you. Don't let them play you. If they say you're overreacting, then you say get over that bridge and get the hell out. Anyways, be safe, people. Bye-bye.